proteins are extremely important macromolecules that are used by the cells of our body in many, many different ways. So proteins have an extremely wide range of different functions. For example, some proteins act as biological catalysts, speeding up different types of biochemical reactions that are used, that are carried out by our cells. For example, the production of ATP involves many different types of enzymes, many different types of biological catalysts. Now, proteins also function in transport. For example, we know that hemoglobin is a type of protein that transports oxygen from the lungs and to the tissues and cells of our body, and oxygen is necessary to basically produce ATP. Now, proteins can also be embedded inside cell membranes. And when proteins are embedded inside cell membranes, usually they act as transport proteins, and they allow the movement of different types of molecules and ions across the cell membrane of cells. Now, proteins are also involved in giving our cells structure. For example, the entire cytoskeleton structure consists of different types of proteins. Proteins also are involved in giving certain cells mobility. For example, sperm cells have a structure known as a flagellum, and that flagellum is necessary to allow the sperm cell to actually move and navigate through the vaginal cavity and through the oviduct, the fallopian tube, in the female reproductive system. And this flagellum is composed predominantly of different types of proteins. Now, proteins are also involved in protecting our cells and our body from different types of pathogenic agents. So antibodies and antigens consist of proteins. Proteins are also involved in communication. For instance, we have these molecules known as hormones, peptide hormones, that are involved in intracellular and cell-to-cell -cell communication. And we'll discuss that much more in future lectures. So as we can see, proteins have many different types of functions. So let's discuss a bit more about proteins. So what are proteins on the molecular level? So proteins basically consist of these subunits, these building blocks we call amino acids. And there are 20 types of amino acids that exist inside our body. So proteins are built from the selection of 20 different amino acids. And the fact that we have 20 different amino acids means we have a great variety of possible sequences for any given protein. And to demonstrate what we mean by that, let's consider a protein that contains only 10 amino acids. So we have amino acid 1, amino acid 2, amino acid 3, all the way to amino acid number 10. Now notice these amino acids are held together by covalent bonds known as peptide bonds. And we'll talk about what those are in much more detail in a future lecture. Now the question we want to answer is, how many possible sequences are there if we have these 10 amino acids and each one of these amino acids can basically be any one of those 20 amino acids. So to carry this out, we have to use a bit of mathematics and probability. So let's begin with amino acid number one. So we have 20 different possibilities for amino acid number one and so we have 20 possibilities. The same thing is true for amino acid number two, for amino acid number three, for amino acid number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, and number 10. Now we have to multiply these out to basically find the total possibility, the total number of possibilities that we can have. And if we multiply these out, we get 20 to the 10th power, and that's about 1.024 times 10 to the 13th possibility. So 10 trillion possibilities exist for an amino, for a protein that consists of only 10 amino acids, and usually proteins consist of hundreds and sometimes thousands of amino acids. And that means there is a great number of different types of sequences that are possible inside the proteins found inside our body. 
Now, what's so special about this sequence of amino acids? Well, as we'll see in a future lecture, it turns out that the sequence of amino acids in a protein actually determines its three-dimensional structure. So under the proper cellular conditions, this linear sequence of amino acids can actually fold into its three-dimensional uh, three structure spontaneously. And once these proteins form their three-dimensional conformation, their function is basically determined. So it turns out, as we'll see in a future lecture, that the three-dimensional uh, three structure of the protein determines its actual function. Now the next question is, what exactly is the difference between one amino acid and another amino acid? Well, basically, amino acids differ from one another based on the side chain group, the functional group that exists on that amino acid. For example, we have one type of amino acid known as glycine, and this contains an H group, while another amino acid contains this side chain group that is known as cysteine. And these two amino acids have different functionalities. For example, cysteine is important in forming these linkages known as disulfide bridges, and we'll talk much more about what these are in a future lecture. So basically, different functional groups have different capabilities and different reactivities. And the arrangement and sequence of these amino acids and their functional groups helps determine the ways in which the proteins are actually involved in helping the different types of reactions that exist in inside our body and this is particularly important when we'll talk about enzymes those biological catalysts because these biological catalysts essentially use these functional groups to carry out different types of reactions in which they speed up the biochemical processes inside our body. Now, different proteins have different characteristics. Some proteins are very, very rigid, while other proteins are not so rigid. So, for example, the rigid proteins might be involved in giving our cells its structure. So, they might be involved in creating the cytoskeleton, while the not so rigid proteins basically are involved in those processes that require a bit more flexibility. Now, proteins do not act by themselves, or usually they don't act by themselves. Proteins usually interact with other proteins or other macromolecules to form these fully functional complexes, and these protein complexes are responsible for creating those different types of processes and reactions. So, for instance, when we study DNA replication, we'll see that a single protein is not actually involved in DNA replication. We have many, many, many different types of proteins that have to work together and form these protein complexes to actually carry out the process of synthesizing and replicating DNA molecules and DNA strands. So another example is the transport proteins found inside our cell membrane. So cell membranes consist of phospholipids. And so these transport proteins have to actually interact with these phospholipids to be able to actually transport those molecules and ions across the cell membrane. So we have many different types of examples, as we'll see in our study of biochemistry in which proteins have to either interact with other proteins or with other macromolecules to actually carry out a specific type of function. Now, the final thing that we have to know about proteins is where they actually come from. So proteins are encoded by the DNA found inside our body. So remember, our cells use DNA to actually create RNA, and then the RNA basically combines with ribosomes, and those ribosomes translate the RNA into proteins. So essentially, our DNA molecules contain specific genes, specific segments of nucleotide that ultimately code for the many different types of proteins that are found and used by the cells of our body. So in the next lecture, we're going to begin our discussion on the amino acids, the different types of amino acids that exist inside our body.